Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the idea of galaxies with extraterrestrial intelligence. And we're essentially going to discuss the idea of a type of a galaxy that's most likely to have an extraterrestrial intelligence similar to us. So let's discuss this and welcome to what the man. So as you probably know by now, there are quite a lot of different galaxies out there. They come in different age groups, they also come in different shapes and sizes. And for the most part, it seems that there are actually a lot more different galaxy types than there are star types. But trying to figure out which of these galaxies most likely has a chance of having extraterrestrial intelligence similar to us, is of course one of the questions we're trying to currently answer, mostly because we'd like to find out if there's anyone else out there. But because there is so much variety with galaxies and also with the types of stars they possess, it's always been kind of difficult to try to establish which of the galaxies is the most likely to have any kind of alien life, specifically the type of life we can find here on Earth. And so for the past few years, for the past few decades actually, scientists were trying to kind of mathematically work out different models and different propositions on where we can possibly find someone else potentially similar to us. Now, the last few studies all focused on a very similar principle. They basically realized that the galaxies like ours, like the Milky Way you see right here, are not really that common, while at the same time don't usually possess the highest number of stars either, and obviously would not probably have highest number of planets as well. On the other hand, the so-called elliptical galaxies, like the very famous and extremely large, actually the biggest galaxy out there, IC1101 that you see right here, are practically the opposite. They have a huge amount of stars, they also have way way more mass and basically bigger everything on the inside, and at the same time probably have a lot more planets orbiting around those stars as well, which of course statistically makes a lot of sense. More stars means probably more planets. So one of the last papers to tackle this idea basically established that the chance of finding extraterrestrial intelligence kind of increases by about 10,000 times if we were to look inside a typical elliptical galaxy, such as IC1101. And back in 2015, the scientists even referred to this as a kind of a cradle of life. So basically, if we wanted to potentially find life, or specifically advanced life, we should maybe look at more of the elliptical galaxies out there. But here's the thing though, that's maybe not necessarily true, at least according to the scientists behind this paper that was just released very recently and who is essentially arguing almost the opposite, suggesting that the chance of finding life in the elliptical galaxy, and that includes some of the larger galaxies out there, is quite the opposite. It would be very very difficult if not impossible to find any life here whatsoever and he gives pretty good reasons for why he thinks so. And first and foremost, what all of this stems from is the idea known as the mediocrity principle, which is to some extent also related to the very old and very well known Copernican principle, which essentially states that humans, and of course Earth, and even the solar system is in no way special, it's very mediocre and it's very average. In other words, when Copernicus was looking at the night skies, he was the first to essentially realize that the sun is not orbiting around Earth. Earth was just another planet in the solar system. And when we expand this idea further to essentially extraterrestrial life and alien life, we need to look at ourselves. We need to realize that we're also not special in any way, Earth, the solar system, and even our galaxy are not special. These are extremely average and not really special environments at all. Earth, the solar system, and of course our galaxy are just an average bunch. Which is exactly why, according to the mediocrity principle, we really should be looking at the average, at the most mediocre and boring for us. Basically at other similar galaxies to the Milky Way, and looking for the conditions where Earth developed as well. And even though this may sound boring, this is exactly what the principle states. If it's typical, if there's no reason to suspect that something is supposed to be special, in that case, it probably is very typical and not special at all. It's very mediocre. And there's actually a really good example from astronomy when this principle worked, um, and actually several times quite successfully. The earliest such example of when this was applied was actually when the early astronomers, including the famous Isaac Newton, wanted to try to figure out how close certain stars were to our planet. 
Now back then they didn't really have very good measurement devices just yet. They also obviously did not have any of the knowledge of the stars we have today, but they still tried. And several scientists, including Kepler and Newton, decided to try to calculate the distance to the nearby Sirius star, which is also one of the brightest stars in the night skies, by literally applying the mediocrity principle. What they did is assume that, well, Sirius, just like our sun, is probably just another star in the night skies. And using this principle, they then tried to um, use its luminosity to discover how far away it was, and not surprisingly, they got the results pretty accurate. It was just a little bit off because Sirius is a little bit different from the Sun, but the idea of this principle worked quite well in this case, and so the scientists could then measure distances to some of the other stars as well. And so using this principle, we can then start asking ourselves a question. If we have intelligent life on Earth, why is it that we don't live in a large elliptical galaxy? Why is it that the Milky Way galaxy does not look like this? And why is it that our sun is not an, uh, for example, a red dwarf, an M-type star? Which is what some scientists suggest could be the star with the highest chance for finding other life as well. According to the mediocrity principle, really the only life so far that has been confirmed is here around the typical G-type star, which is our sun, on the outskirts of the galaxy known as the Milky Way, located right there in a somewhat boring area of the galaxy. So all of this is basically the mediocrity principle, and according to this principle, other intelligent life is probably going to be located in a somewhat similar environment. But the author of this paper doesn't just tell us that this is exactly where we're going to find other intelligent life, he also provides a few details for why he believes life around other galaxies would be kind of difficult. First of all, a lot of these um, elliptical galaxies were very, very likely extremely, extremely powerful back in the days and possessed quite a lot of lethal radiation that most likely stripped most of the planets of any potential life, or at least any advanced life. Many of these galaxies were also extremely powerful quasars, basically spewing out huge tsunami-like waves of um, radioactive material and extremely, extremely powerful energy that very likely once again stripped any planet of any potential for life. We know that the Milky Way galaxy did not have anything as powerful. It very likely only had minor outbursts that very likely never reached the outskirts where we're located. So one of the reasons why life probably exists in the outskirts of the Milky Way is actually because the radiation just never really reached that far. It may have uh, stripped all of the planets and all of the planetary objects in the central region of the galaxy, but the outskirts were totally fine. Now we expect Milky Way to go through all of this later on in life, possibly within about 4 to 5 billion years from now, when it combines with the Andromeda galaxy, but until then it's probably still going to be a much more milder place compared to what a lot of these elliptical galaxies went through to acquire their shape and also to acquire all of these different types of stars. On the other hand, many of these stars, and also um, basically the planetary systems here, would be very low in metallicity. In astronomy, we usually refer to metallicity as basically the ability for stars to create planets. So when you hear someone say the star has a lot of metallicity, it just means that it has a lot of other materials except for hydrogen and helium, which of course also usually implies that the star can have terrestrial planets and can have a lot of things in the star system. But these elliptical galaxies, they don't often have high metallicity stars, which is why their color is so different as well. So for the most part, all of these galaxies have stars that have very low metallicity, and basically, if we were to look at a typical planet here, it would most likely be some sort of a gas giant. These uh, types of galaxies would very likely have a lot more gas giants and a lot more other gas-like objects, as opposed to having actual terrestrial planets like Earth. Now that's not to say that we're not going to be able to find extraterrestrial intelligence around these, but as of today, um, according to mediocrity principle, we should be able to find extraterrestrial intelligence around terrestrial planets, not around gas giants. On the other hand, because these galaxies also do not produce any new stars and uh, basically are, in a sense, well, you can call them dead galaxies, they're essentially unable to create any more unusual planetary systems which could potentially host life in the future. The Milky Way, on the other hand, still produces quite a lot of stars and will be doing so for a very long time. And since a lot of these stars are also very likely M-type dwarfs, 
which we already know are not particularly good at maintaining habitable conditions, this would also suggest that many of these objects here would probably be very very different from anything we can find in the solar system, or more specifically none of this would be similar to planet Earth. And the more gas giants there are in these galaxies, the more likely that um, their migration toward the center of the actual solar system or star system would actually prevent other terrestrial planets from forming. In other words, the chance for these galaxies to have planets like Earth is actually a lot lower than anything here in the Milky Way galaxy. Once again suggesting that the mediocrity principle might be right after all. The only way for us to find another extraterrestrial intelligence is to look in an extremely similar position somewhere else in a similar galaxy like for example the Andromeda galaxy which is also extremely similar to the Milky Way. It's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit more massive, but overall it's very very similar in a lot of respect. And where exactly should we be looking? Well, once again, somewhere on the outskirts of one of these spiral arms, very likely around a G-type star, similar to our Sun, which are actually kind of difficult to see. And we should be looking for a terrestrial planet orbiting here as well. This right here would be the most likely place for us to find other extraterrestrial intelligence and similar galaxies to this like the one that we're about to see right there, a much smaller galaxy known as Triangulum, are essentially the best candidates. These are the galaxies we should be examining in a little bit more detail if we want to discover if someone is trying to communicate with the rest of the universe. But honestly, so far all of this is still very theoretical. It's basically just ideas based on mathematics and based on statistics. We don't truly know if we're going to ever find anyone else out there, and we still have absolutely no idea why it's so difficult to essentially discover any alien life out there. This is essentially the Fermi Paradox, something that we still have no answer to. But until we learn more, check out the paper in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Consider supporting this channel Patreon, it does help me quite a lot, and alternatively you can also support this channel by buying the beautiful, wonderful person t-shirt that I'm wearing right now and you can also find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.